Another year, another new saga universe to take a look at. And this time, we're heading to the late BCs of the Second Punic War. A rich vein of historical flavour to tap, and one that the folks behind Saga have siphoned with their usual style and aplomb. The book itself is the standard Saga supplement format, and will be familiar to all current players. It's a beautifully designed hardback book, and comes with battle boards. We wonder if there's any way to perhaps adjust the design slightly so boards fit flat within the cover, but that's a minor gripe. Six boards are included, each representing one of the new factions. Getting into the book, pages 5-7 to seven are a whistle-stop tour of the Age of Hannibal, including one of many inspirational battle scenes photographed for the book, featuring fine gripping beasts and other manufacturers' models, and lovely scenery. The How to Use This Supplement section, from page 8, will be familiar to Saga fans. As usual, it explains the battle boards to players, then gets into some useful Hannibal-specific suggestions. The relative difficulty to command factions is a handy guide, and Iberians look to be the most difficult to master this time around, with Romans and Greguli the most forgiving for novice players. There's the first sight of the new dice that are in production for the factions too. These aren't included, but we got our hands on some and confirm that they roll in that rolly way that dice are supposed to. New rules and equipment are on pages 12 and 13 and contain some awesome details. Not quite making it to the top end of the excitement scale are the Sarissa and Chariots. Sarissas limit movement, but are very effective against mounted enemies, while Chariots provide some mobility and bonuses at the expense of being unable to traverse terrain. Getting into more of the fun stuff though, we have Elephants and War Pigs, which will surely bring a smile to all. Elephants are THE troop associated with Hannibal, and will hit hard, with trampling and mad with pain special rules that bring much pachyderm potential and pachyderm panic. Countering those elephants are the legendary war pigs, who are covered in spikes, set ablaze, and, let's face it, gloriously ridiculous. Ruses come next on page 14, one of two new game options provided in this book. They come in two forms. There are generic ruses, which can be used across the factions, and there are unique ruses, limited to a specific faction and identified by their corresponding symbol. The ruses are all available to download from the Studio Tomahawk website. This is actually the only way to see the generic ruses right now, and it means you won't need to destroy your book to cut out the unique ones that are at the end of each faction section. Ruses allow you to upgrade units, move terrain, move units, generate saga dice, and much more. The effects these can have will certainly be quite game-changing, so it's suggested they're kept for when you have more experience playing with the factions. And talking of which, onto those factions, six in total that make up the meat of this book. And let's be honest, they're probably the reason why we're all here in this flip through in the first place. Happily, there's a lot to take in. First up are the Carthaginians. As with all the faction pages, each section begins with a historical background, and the Carthaginians get quite a meaty one before their troops are explored, faction rules are laid out, and the units and legendary units are listed. But that's not all. Each faction section ends with a summary of their playstyle and tactics. These are relayed by Diodorus of Sicily, a Greek historian of antiquity with quite the pedigree. Using him as a characterful voice to describe the factions is just one of many design flourishes throughout the book. Once Diodorus has handed out his advice, which is generally useful stuff, and especially good at giving a tactical overview of what each faction is about before you perhaps invest in its models, each faction section ends with its unique ruses, which we talked about earlier. Now, rather than go into exacting detail on the specifics of faction, we'll have a quick overview. If you want to know more, fear not. We've got a deep dive into this book that's coming up in one of our next issues of War Games Illustrated, so keep an eye out for that. Okay. So that was the Carthaginians, who can mix citizens, contingents, and unaffiliated among their usual troops, as well as bringing the power of elephants and heavy chariots to battle. Stopping Carthage's dominance is the Republic of Rome. In saga terms, they have two types of warlord, a consul and a tribune. And while their troop types are nothing too unusual, their warriors and hearthguards can become maniple units. Gauls are next, on page 34 and they get their own game mechanic, Fervor. This allows you to improve battleboard abilities, but there's a limit. Once a unit has three Fervor, it cannot use any advanced abilities, so there's a risk-reward kind of element there. You can see the rules for Viridormus, King of the Gassetti here. Each faction has two legendary units. Viridormus is a mercenary leader and a fighter who brings along a bunch of naked mates to battle. 
ignoring uneven terrain and able to close ranks while using javelins. The Krakulli have been split into three flavours, a pirate, Syracusan or Italiots, with minor differences between them. The Iberian section begins on page 51. Like their Gallic cousins, they have their own mechanic, Gorilla, which uses generated tokens to activate units or to perform abilities from their board. Their unique ruses are in fitting with the Gorilla Warfare style of the Iberians. Harassment causes fatigue to enemies as they deploy, trap causes casualties to units moving through uneven ground, and all the factions have similarly flavourful options. Numidians have no half guard at all, but this is balanced by being able to recruit masses of elephants. They are force reliant on cavalry and shooting, and their battle board feeds into that. With the six factions done, mercenaries can add variety to your army. Their section starts on page 66, and comes with a handy guide to cross-reference who can take each of the eight units for hire. Each mercenary unit has their own roles and niches on the battlefield. These are covered until the book's final section, on page 70. Epic Saga. Epic Saga gives players the rules to act out big games, to combine warbands, to make mass armies, to get together with fellow gamers and fight together in multiplayer games, which is not the best timing while we live in these constrained times, but it's exciting all the same. Games are between 12 and 18 points, there are three warbands on each side, and at least half the points must be spent on one faction. Warbands are assigned a sequence number by their commander, determining their order, which will lead to some interesting tactical decisions. Warbands that use the same board literally use the same board, allowing dice to be left to bolster those future actions. Victory is determined by morale. Once two warbands on one side have failed and become demoralised, they've been defeated. To counter this, commanders get inspiration points to spend on abilities, which affect certain aspects of the fights and really impact demoralised warbands. Epic Saga does look packed with potential, and this book on the whole is a wonderful addition to the Saga world. There seems to be a lot of balance, and if you like this period, or skirmish games, or both, it feels like a must-buy. And did we mention, it not only has elephants, but war pigs? This video has been brought to you by WI Prime, War Games Illustrated Magazine's online members club. View more videos or find out more about WI Prime by following these links.